the idea presented by the idea by the words "I am ready" implies the fact of sufficient preparation. Dictionary says of ready, having made preparations, equipped, supplied with what is necessary for for some object or purpose, in fit condition for doing anything, going anywhere. Thus, it is a general statement in relationship to being ready. Some, it could apply to things. It could apply to people. We're going to approach it from the standpoint that there are certain things that we as Christians need and should be ready for. And the first one is to receive to be ready to receive the truth. And in regards to receiving the truth, proper preparation must be made. The hearer's heart has to be prepared to receive the truth. In Ezra, the seventh chapter and verse 10, it says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. That first statement, he had prepared his heart, is the very idea that we're talking about. Pre proper preparation needs to be made in relationship to receiving the truth. In his, it says he had prepared his heart to seek the law. And then he prepared his heart to do the law. And he prepared his heart to teach that law. But there was the proper preparation that he made so that he could do those things. One of the great parables of Jesus is the parable of the sower. We mentioned it this morning. It's also recorded in Luke, the 8th chapter. And in the first few verses of the chapter, Jesus gives the parable that a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the wayside, and it was trodden down, and fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon the rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. As he then explains that parable, in verse 15 of Luke 8, it talks about uh, the one that fell on the good ground, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having received the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. There's the honest and good heart, but there's three other soils. What's the difference between the good soil and that which is not so good? Those other three soils. It was the fact that the good soil had been prepared to receive the seed. If you go out and you don't prepare the land as a farmer and you just start sowing the seed, you're not going to be a very successful farmer because other things will start growing. Uh, in fact, they probably are already growing. You first learn to prepare the soil so that you can plant the seed and then the seed can bear fruit. Well, that's the, uh, the problem with the other soils. It, they had not been prepared to receive the truth. Notice a few verses later in that uh, Luke, the 8th chapter, verse 18. He says, Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. 
For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and to whom and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. A warning as to how we hear. Uh, another passage tells us to beware of what we hear. But this is how we hear. Because our hearts need to be prepared to receive God's word. How you hear. That deals with us. What we hear is, while it deals a little bit with us, it deals with others more so as to what they are saying. And thus, we need to be careful as to what we hear. But here it's how we hear. That's dealing purely with us. Because we have to have that heart that has be, become prepared so we can receive the truth. You know, we run across people on occasion, and maybe it's not on occasion now, maybe it's uh, more so this way than any other way now, that it's, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind's made up. And you start dealing with facts, and they don't want to hear those facts, because that is their mindset. They don't care what the facts are. They want their way, or what they think is right, and it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. You see, they don't have a heart that is prepared to receive the truth in that situation. And we're talking about no matter what it might be. Uh, it could be from a political standpoint. It could be from a science standpoint. It could be from a religious standpoint. Their hearts are closed. They're not going to receive the truth. Why? Because their hearts aren't prepared for it. They've closed their heart. Now, in regards to what we hear, the truth needs to be preached. And that's another problem that we see. A lot of times truth isn't being preached. Paul, in writing to the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, says that after the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. But what if error is preached? Well, there's a problem there. Because that error is not going to save. And a lot of people will accept the error instead of accepting the truth. But the truth is that which needs to be preached. That's the way God has determined to save people, for the truth to be preached. In Romans 10th chapter, he goes back to the prophecy of Joel, actually. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was Joel's prophecy in Joel 2, verses 28 starts there. The actual verse that he's quoting here is verse 32. So in that section is the quotation. But here is the quote, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he asks the question, How can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. By the way, if anyone should ever call upon this verse in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See if they'll go down to verse 16. They have not all obeyed the gospel. What is calling upon the name of the Lord? It's obedience to the gospel. That's the context that he's dealing with. The preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ so they can call upon the name of the Lord. How? By obeying the gospel. Now we can talk about how to obey the gospel. If you wanted to go through and you can see in 1 Corinthians 13, all right, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
We obey Romans 6, 17, and 18, a form of that doctrine which was delivered unto us. What is that form? Romans 6 and verse 3 and verse 4. It is the act of baptism, how that we are baptized into Christ's death. We're buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now what is it to obey the gospel? It's being baptized. That baptism, of course, based upon our faith, repentance, and confession of our faith. So how do you call upon the name of the Lord? When you obey the gospel, when you're baptized in water. That's how you obey the gospel. But that truth is that which must be preached. Sadly, we've got far too many in our society, and yes, even in the church, who no longer preach the truth. If a person's heart is properly prepared to receive God's Word, but God's Word is not preached, then what happens to their heart and the preparation that they have made? Well, what happens to a field if you plow it and get the field prepared, the ground is prepared to receive the seed, and no seed is ever planted? It goes to waste. Only the truth, though, can set us free. Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If we want salvation, if we want to be saved, we're going to have to receive the truth. But in order to receive the truth, our hearts must first be prepared. I think one of the great great problems that anybody, I know I have it, and I think anyone, if they're honest, has, is that they go into God's Word with preconceived ideas. And instead of extracting out of the text what is actually there, they insert into the text their own ideas. Now, we don't have to do that, but it's difficult not to. And as a result... You know, you go talk to a denominational friend and you try and teach them about the necessity of baptism for salvation. And you can read all of those passages about baptism and what they're doing is they're, they're putting into those passages what their preconceived ideas with the result that they, they reject baptism. That's what the denominational world has done. And when we try and talk to them, what happens? There's a rejection of it. Instead of being, having a heart that's open to receive the truth, they're actually going to put their, their concepts into God's Word. And they're going to thus base everything upon what they already think instead of simply obeying the truth. I'll I'll use this illustration because dealing with myself, those are the best ones, I guess, uh, and sometimes most embarrassing ones. But I remember years ago, this is way, way back, um, and I heard the view that in Acts 2.38, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that it was the miraculous. And this was a preacher in a lectureship preaching this, and I was just, I'll put it uh, maybe a little bit exaggerating, beside myself, I could not believe anyone who called themselves a gospel preacher could hold such a thing. My heart at that time, my mind was not ready to accept that view. Didn't matter what the view was, I, that wasn't right. I wasn't going to accept it. Well, through a period of study and through several years, I now hold that view. But at first, my mind was closed to it. Now then, as I say, we can open our hearts. We should open our hearts. 
my immediate reaction the first time that I heard it, rejection. The point is, we should never have that type of an attitude that I had back then. Whether that position was right or wrong, we should be open enough that we are willing to study the subject. If it's right, accept it. If it's wrong, reject it. But you don't just, I hear it and I'm rejecting it immediately because my preconceived ideas. We must, though, that's proper preparation to receive God's Word. Our hearts being prepared. Good illustration in the Bible of people who had prepared their hearts. Cornelius. In Acts 10th chapter, we all know the, the account. But in verse 33 of Acts 10, as Cornelius is relating to Peter the events that took place, he says, Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore we are all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Cornelius and all of those that were there at that time, they had prepared their heart. We have a desire to hear God's word. They didn't know it at the time. And thus, called to Peter. And Peter comes, we're here, we're ready. Our minds, our hearts are ready to hear God's Word. The Bereans, in Acts 17th chapter, we talk often about the Bereans and their nobility, that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the Word, I know it's this phrase, with all readiness of mind and search the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. They had an open mind. They were willing to receive God's Word, the truth, but they didn't just simply accept it as a mindless robot that could not think, could not study, could not do anything. They received the truth, but then they studied it and made sure that what it was being said was true. They could have just immediately cut it off and said, no, we reject it. But that's not the Bereans. They received the truth, but they searched to make sure then it was true. And that's the attitude that each one of us should have as well. The day of Pentecost... After that gospel sermon, 3,000 souls responded. They cried out unto Peter and the apostles, What shall we do? Because they were pricked in their hearts. And Peter tells them, Here's what you have to do to be saved. You have to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Then in verse 41, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. The same day they were adding to them about 3,000 souls. So here's these 3,000 souls that received the word, and they did so gladly. Now why did they receive the word? Because their hearts were opened to be receptive to the truth. On the other hand, the majority of times, people are not receptive to the truth. Their hearts are not opened. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, Jesus dealt with this very thing. In verse 15, when he says, This people's heart is waxed gross, and their eyes 
Our ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be, and should be converted and I should heal them. What is it? Here's these people. They had closed their hearts. They were not receptive to the truth. Now, that's a quote from Isaiah. Because Isaiah was applying it to the people of his day. Jesus was applying it to the people of his day. And we could apply it to the people of our day in, from a general standpoint. The majority of people, their eyes are closed. They don't want to accept the truth. The main or one of the main reasons that Christianity is rejected is not because of the facts, not because of the evidence. It's because people want to live in such a way that Christianity will not allow. And thus, they reject Christianity. That was one of the appeals of evolution. Because people realize there's... As far as our origin, there's either a supreme being or there's evolution. They want to reject the idea of a supreme being. Facts? No. Evidence? No. Because we want to live in such a way that Christianity will not allow. And thus, we're going to accept evolution doesn't matter what the facts are. Their hearts are closed because they want to live in such a way, and Christianity will not allow it. You cannot be a Christian and live that way, the way that they desire. And so they're going to be prejudiced against the truth. Because they don't really want to live right. They don't want to do right. There's a lot of members of the church who fall away. Same reason. They obey the gospel, but they then start seeing the demands of Christianity. And what happens? They leave because they're not willing to make the sacrifice to live according to God's word. Their hearts are not really receptive to the truth. They're like that soil that's not the good soil. And if you remember, three of the four soils in the parable of the sower received the word. Two of the three had bad soil, though, and did not continue. They fell away. Only the good soil endured. And so we need to always be of a mind willing to be receptive to the truth. Preparing our hearts to receive it. And just as another aspect of this, we also need to be preparing our hearts to receive the truth from a personal standpoint. Instead of applying it to someone else, applying it to self. Sometimes it takes a, a Nathan to go to David, Thou art the man. <laughs> but it should not take that. We should hear God's word and we should look at ourselves. And as Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. And make that personal application of God's word to self. But then, second, we need to be ready to answer questions. Peter would write in 2 Peter 3 and verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. Sometimes I hear 
brethren, use this verse to apply to just about any Bible subject that might come around. That you need to be ready to answer any Bible question. Well, that's not what this is talking about. We can get into some Bible questions that no one will be able to answer. We can get some questions that it will take hours of study in order to be able to answer it. A lot of people, sadly, are not willing to put in that type of work. They just want you to tell them what to believe. That's not what this is talking about. If you look at that phrase, a reason of the hope that is in you. He's dealing with our eternal salvation. There's a lot of questions in the Bible that do not deal with our eternal salvation. Does it mean we shouldn't study them? No. It's good to study them. It's good to gain our knowledge and to grow in knowledge. But does it pertain to our eternal salvation? No. We need to be able to answer those questions that deal with our salvation. When those on the day of Pentecost, when they heard Peter's preaching and the apostles, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter was able to give them an immediate answer. If someone asked us, what shall I do to be saved? We should be able to give them an immediate answer. We should know. Or Saul is a good illustration in Acts 9th chapter. After he sees the Lord on that road to Damascus, And he says, Who art thou, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It's hard to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Notice the Lord didn't tell him what to do. He said, Go into the city, and there it will be told you what you need to do. And so he appears to Ananias and says, Ananias, go to this road called Straight, and you'll find Peter, or you'll find Saul, and he's there praying. He basically needs to know what to do. And when Ananias comes to him, he sees a man who believes in Christ now. He is repentant, has a penitent attitude, and he tells him, Why tarest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. He didn't come in and say, Wait a minute, Saul, I need to go and study for a few hours. I have to go and ask a preacher and uh, find out what needs to be said. He was able to answer the question immediately. Same thing with the Philippian jailer. He comes before Paul and Silas. Sirs, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Can we answer the basic questions as to what we must do, what others must do in order to be saved? If we can't, there's something wrong with us. We haven't done the proper preparation that we need to do in order to answer the questions of the hope that is within us. Can you answer the questions as to how we or why we live the way that we live? The things that we should oppose, the things that we support, can we set forth in a biblical standpoint those principles of Christianity as to how we live, because that's the hope that is within us. The grace of God, you remember Titus 2 and verse 11 and verse 12, he says, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, 
teaching us. And it's not, it doesn't say teaching us to become a Christian. It says we're to, it teaches us to live a certain way, to deny certain things, and to look for the glorious appearing. We are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We are to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Can we answer the questions as to those things that God considers ungodly? That worldly lust? Can we answer those questions dealing with living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world? You see, that's dealing with the hope that we have. Because Christianity is not just getting baptized and that's the end of it. There is a hope that we have before us as Christians that we have to live in a certain way. We have to deny certain things within our life so that we can have that hope. Now Peter is saying, you be ready always to answer those questions dealing with that hope. That hope includes, yes, the denying and the living. And yes, looking for that glorious hope. That glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But those things take study. It takes time. It takes learning. Peter told, uh, or Paul told Timothy to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. American Standard, instead of study, uses give diligence. It's setting forth, you put forth an effort. You put forth the proper effort that will attain the results that are needed so that you can be approved to God, so that you will know those things. That takes study. And in a reasonable time frame, we should be able to teach others. The Hebrew writer said, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, Hebrews 5 and verse 12, there was a time element. Yes, you have obeyed the gospel. There's a time element. We understand that in which you are learning. But that time element for some Christians, it seems like, is not just simply a short period of time. It becomes years and decades and I would say centuries. Because some Christians never get to the point where they can be teachers. And Paul, if he be the writer of Hebrews, is condemning them. The time ye ought to be teachers. And what is it? You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. You haven't studied enough, you haven't put the proper preparation in enough to where you can teach others now. And you are to be shamed as a result of it. And remember Paul, he's the writer of Hebrews, is writing to these Jewish Christians who now are going back into apostasy. They're going back into Judaism and leaving Christ. And the implication is, If you had put in the proper study and the proper work and you had the proper knowledge now that you could be teachers instead of trying to feed still on milk and could be feeding on strong milk or strong meat, that you wouldn't be apostatizing. The very reason that you're apostatizing and that this letter is needing to be written to you to prevent that apostasy is because you have not made the proper preparation to grow and to develop in a way that you have uh, being able to answer that hope that is within us. And we have Christians today who sit in the pews of our buildings, 
who hear sermon after sermon, Bible class after Bible class, and it goes in one ear and out the other because they never learn. They never put forth the proper effort to develop themselves. Now, if we were talking about physical food and keeping us alive, how many of us would survive on maybe three meals on Sunday and one meal on Wednesday and nothing else? And yet, we expect from a spiritual standpoint, which is far more important than the physical, to survive that way. And it's an impossibility. We've got Christians who will sit there and they do not tell others, they cannot tell others the hope that they have of salvation because in reality they don't know. They've not put forth the effort to work and to study. The very basic questions of salvation. And yes, sometimes it's, oh yeah, that's here, believe, repent, be baptized. Well, why should I do that? Well, because my preacher, and that's, well, that's what I've been taught all through the years. Well, what does the Bible say? Uh, well, let me go ask a preacher, an elder. Because they don't know. They can't give God's word. Because they have not done the proper preparation. Be prepared is what Peter is saying. Be ready. And yet so many times... We're not ready. We're not prepared to give that answer. And yet, each and every one of us should be. If you have not obeyed that gospel, then you need to this, this afternoon. Be, have a heart that is receptive to hear the truth and to know the truth, and to obey it. If you have obeyed the gospel and become a child of God, but you haven't lived in such a way that God wants you to be, you haven't denied ungodliness and worldly lust, you haven't lived godly, soberly, and righteously in this present world, you haven't been looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ then why not repent of your sins this afternoon? Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them and begin that life of putting in the proper preparation so that you will be ready at all times. Ready to do what God wants you to do. Ready to answer questions relating to our salvation. Ready to tell others of that great salvation that we have. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation.